sorry for that. Uh, so it's just to say that uh, that you know it's very important to understand the rationale for uh, decisions of uh, farmers because you know these decisions would have strong implications on the other uh, levels, either the landscape level or the plot level and uh, uh, the the you know the biophysical interactions within the plot and between the different components of the system: crop, uh, soil, uh, erosion, uh, uh, you know, uh, nitrogen depletion, organic matter. Uh, uh, growth within the soil, fertility, things like that. So, uh, uh, and and we actually need farm models to respond to different questions. If we take this consideration, or the we should uh, what innovation should I should I uh, or should should I adopt? Uh, what uh, what it will bring to me in terms of expected uh, benefits? How much it will cost? Uh, what are the additional investments needed uh, if I take this decision? But also, what are the level of risks which I need to assume? And take into consideration if I will take these uh, decisions. So that's the the you know the that's the questions related to the decisions. But in reality, but or that's the way it, we traditionally do economic modeling and uh, farm modeling. But uh, uh, we we actually also thought that the responses to those questions are very straightforward and are based only on economic calculations. Uh, and uh, from there came two problems. So the decision taken by the farmers would have an impact beyond the farm level, as I previously said, landscape, communities, pollution, externalities, etc. But also farmers' decisions are sometimes taken with limited cognitive capacity, with also limited information. So you, the farmers, as we know them, uh, they might be they might be very rational in terms of economic uh, decisions, but uh, they may lack some information and some good calculations when it comes to looking at uh, at the long term profit at, uh, at at the soil fertility laws and things like that so how can we consider all of these uh, uh, shortcomings into a more comprehensive uh, uh, modeling frameworks which can you know can help us uh, tackling those two problems and for problem one uh, the literature came with uh, solutions where system approaches were uh, 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 have been used to promote and assess technologies and innovations, uh, but also for problem two, in terms of limited cognitive capacity and limited information, uh, there was a need or there was a, a set of uh, soft, soft methods, which we call soft modeling methods, which goes beyond the rigid mathematical modeling of farm decisions uh, to integrate the modeling of social dimensions and institutional dimensions, uh, etc. Uh, and from there uh, came the, uh, you know, the, if we start, I mean, in, in the last 20, 25 years in the literature, we start to talk more about uh, uh, farm modeling using uh, system approaches. And there was a strong uh, uh, conceptual arguments or backgrounds behind these uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this modeling tools. And this relates mostly to the, what today is stable, stabilized as uh, what we call socio-ecological uh, systems uh, approach. Uh, where the agricultural system is actually uh, designed or conceptualized as composed of few components and interacting with each other and with their uh, active and passive uh, environment. And those interactions are of different kinds, ecological, economic, uh, social, and that's why we call it socio-ecological systems. So the conceptual background is actually starts to reflect in the literature, starts to reflect this uh, complexity of the system and then uh, methodologies actually need to follow uh, to be able to analyze those complex uh, relationships. And that's why uh, we start to talk more about uh, options by context, as uh, Santiago was describing. So we need to reflect the uh, So we need to reflect. Uh, uh, we need to reflect uh, on the diversity of the of the different uh, farm types uh, using, and then we start. We start to use multivariate typologies and even uh, beyond that. Uh, we also start to use bioeconomic modeling and this bioeconomic modeling can be either uh, rigid mathematical programming of other parametric and uh, or other parametric and non-parametric approaches. Uh, it can be uh, it can be advanced as the farm design model, or it can be even uh, much simpler and composed of only mathematical equations with biophysical functional uh, equations. Uh, simply, we start to use more Bayesian uh, methods where we track the causality uh, between the system components. 
the system uh, system components of different types uh, economic social institutional but also biophysical soil uh, plant uh, etc uh, and all of that is Uh, and the interactions of the different uh, types uh, across the system component in a more accurate accurate uh, way. Uh, so to start with the first set of uh, methods, you know, as described by Santiago, typologies are must if you want to focus on options on relevant options by contexts. And I think uh, that was uh, nicely presented by Santiago. And uh, these uh, typologies are part of uh, a big family called the multivariate. Uh, multivariate uh, uh, methodology, uh, analysis methodologies. And what I wanted to add uh, uh, to what Santiago was saying is that actually, as you may all know, uh, typologies, we can do them for the farm systems, not only based on structural variables or characteristics of those farm systems, but if we want to reflect the diversity of the farming systems in terms of soil fertility, for example, we can take we can make our observations of a good set of farms. We can look to some variables or proxies reflecting the fertility of the soil. Uh, we can measure them in each farm, and then we can make that typology based on uh, on farm uh, uh, on soil fertility. And then the farm types obtain it. We can go to them and we can make economic interventions, for example, to tackle trade-offs related to soil fertility. So just to say that multivariate and typologies are not necessarily done for uh, to farmers to differentiate them based on their size or cultivations or things like that. We can do them for different purposes, biophysical or social, or even, you know, depending on the mindset of, of, of the farm leaders or something like that. And that's why also in some of our typologies, we start, we try to reflect on or to make typologies of socio, socio-ecological systems, not only social systems or economic or structural uh, typologies. And these typologies, of course, will help us once done to compare the systems and set the priorities of interventions for each uh, for each uh, types. But they will can also help us to analyze system systems dynamics and changes or transformation over time. We know that system transformation over time is something which is under investigated in the literature. And uh, there are some good examples where uh, typologies uh, uh, over two uh, slots of time can help us looking uh, how the same type, uh, farm type, is evolving through time uh, and uh, understand the dynamics and the transformations uh, within these, uh, these systems and uh, check if they are getting more sustainable, more intensified or not. The second level or set of, uh, of, uh, of methods uh, relates to the bio bioeconomic modeling and that's uh, here I cited the example of the farm design. I'm not going to expand a lot on these but just to say that these are typically the models or the methods where we optimize uh, uh, what we call uh, optimization function or an objective function. And sometimes it can be multi-objective functions. We need to maximize or optimize two or three conflictual objectives, organic matter and profits. And at the same time, we have we optimize under constraints because we try to reflect the real situation in the farm and all the constraints farmers are uh, facing. And then uh, to make our also modeling exercise more realistic because we don't simply optimize farmers usually take decisions and their restrictions and, and their limited environments and bouncing constant bounding constraints uh sorry what happened so uh, when we optimize, uh, try to optimize the, the model, like the farm design model, and this is also an addition to what, uh, to what Santiago was uh, uh, mentioning, is that we start from the current performances of the different farm type identified, and we try to convert them using what we call biophysical functional equations into, uh, into we try to convert those current performances into quantifiable or quantified uh, proxies and indicators like the nitrogen use efficiency within each system, organic balance, matter balance within each system, etc., etc. And based on those uh, many objectives, we can then try to make ranking and, uh, and optimize and look to the, to the possible, uh, possible solutions. And as you see here, um, we try. We can try to make some some uh, scenarios, some simulations, and see if we introduce barley, if we introduce uh, different types of crops or innovations, CLCA innovations in this case. How is that going to affect the uh, uh, relative feed sufficiency and uh, 
yeah, I think we skipped the uh, name Plaza Access. I think it's it was about the uh, you know the uh, uh, the the profit of the of the farm. So we can look at the same indicators from both uh, sides and see how they are evolving before uh, uh, before uh, uh, to guide and help uh, with uh, with uh, uh, to help guiding the the project interventions and what what would be the interventions which will uh, result into the best uh, uh, results uh, for the farmers. Uh, other methods uh, relates to what we call the Bayesian uh, methods, and this again here we are trying to tackle the complexity of interactions within the system. We are trying to may have modeling frameworks which combines economic quantitative variables with qualitative uh, and uh, and biophysical uh, vari variables and proxies. Uh, and this type of Bayesian methods are actually based, are tracking the causality between different uh, events, events of different nature, economic events and non-economic events, including, uh, you know, the rainfall events and things like that. And they are very useful in uh, in explaining the, uh, the 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 patterns of uh, of some of, in explaining the behavior of some of some uh, farmers and explaining some phenomena based on uh, probability distributions within uh, of the we know probability distributions collected within a, a sample of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of of farms and in this case we try to quantify the crop residue to understand as you see in the mother node in the top the crop residue left on the soil why some farmers leave uh, small quantities, why others leave uh, strong quantities. We can also play with some scenarios. Uh, we can, uh, you know, make some simulations if we want to maximize the, uh, uh, not if we want probabilities, uh, if we want to find in all our sample probabilities of crop residue more than 500 kilograms, what should we do? And then we fix it at 100% and we can see the posterior probabilities, how they change. This is just to say that, yeah, it's also those are soft methods which are very useful for system modeling. There are also what we call the partial least uh, square uh, regressions, uh, where the uh, events, uh, the early uh, latent uh, variables or events are explained by one or more uh, indicators. And here uh, we you see the blue, the blue uh, dots are const what we call constructs, constructs or vari variable constructs. We construct them based on indicators, uh, and then we can assess within our pattern the effect of V3 directly on V1. But we can also assess the indirect effect of V3 on V2 through V1. And that's very useful sometimes to understand, for example, the impact of uh, uh, climate uh, variability on uh, profit through uh, the practice uh, management, for example, if we consider. So that's very, really, very useful also to understand the causality and the relationships, complex relationships within the system. Uh, uh, and uh, we here also we can uh, you know we can compare between groups and we can test for significance if we have female male groups if we have system one system two or different type of systems and we can compare the same functional relations and how they differ across across uh, across uh, systems. Uh, now uh, you remember I talked about social uh, about social attributes. Farmers don't take decisions only based on economic. Uh, uh, attributes and indicators. Sometimes they need. Uh, uh, they sometimes they take decisions based on their place in the society, in the communities. Uh, sometimes also, you know, uh, there is a there is a what we call you know um, uh, uh, actor weight uh, uh, on the on the ground, which need to be considered. And that's uh, for us as researchers become very interesting and useful when we want to scale technologies. It's very important for us to map the local actors based on their influence and on their dependence to others or on other to others. And based on that, we can rank uh, these actors with whom we are working uh, according to their uh, social wave and influence and uh, prioritize the ones with whom we want or we would like to work to uh, scale and to mainstream innovations uh, uh, locally or to change policies and things like that. And there are many methodologies such as the MACTOR methodology, but also there are what we call the social network analysis. Uh, which uh, is useful to depict again the actor's wave and influence, and it helps us again to you know to develop scaling agendas for project managers uh, uh, by setting, for example, the right partnerships by looking to this uh, to this figure, for example. I know that I have to, to I should have you know I need to have the right partnerships with water user associations with uh, farmer input providers. I definitely need to involve them because they have a strong influence on farmers, etc., etc. And this is really. 
uh, a way to quantitatively assess social influences and social attributes within uh, within uh, within uh, 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 through modeling uh, uh, through modeling at the landscape uh, uh, modeling of farmers decision but it's a modeling at the landscape level so it's also become very flexible to integrate the social dimension into these modeling approaches so to conclude uh, just to say that most of these approaches we use them by ourselves in the CLCA uh, uh, analysis and uh, approaches to map uh, stakeholders to understand the influences. But really, something I learned after I think 15 years of working on uh, on uh, farm modeling is that uh, um, uh, is that the uh, the assessment of all the interactions between the farmer and the rest of his system uh, components uh, uh, can be done through very uh, complex and advanced methods, but can also be done through uh, very more simpler uh, and less complicated methods. And sometimes, really, we get uh, uh, we get the same uh, the same results. Simple approaches such as the face to face discussions with farmers, the or with communities, the focus group, these in depth focus group discussions, if they are well done, can really lead to the same results uh, of uh, with uh, you know with less uh, complex and costly methods can help us to prioritize to better understand our uh, our uh, uh, farmers, the way they take decisions, what stimulates and what are their priority, what are the entry points for their systems. And how uh, and how can we um, help them tackling that? Now, the mat still, even if we do that, sometimes we will always need mathematical bioeconomic modeling uh, for uh, for for making uh, ex ante, for example, accurate impact assessment based on multi-impact indicators. We need sometimes this type of uh, ex ante assessment to know if we do this, what exactly are we going to earn. To generate evidence for uh, policy dialogues, for uh, policy lobbying, for uh, you know that's also something we cannot have it uh, simply by simple approaches. We need some advanced uh, calculations and methods and approaches. So uh, just to say that we really, when we work about with farmers, we need the combination of uh, advanced uh, system modeling uh, tools and approaches, but also sometimes we should not forget that uh, the simple ways of interacting with farmers and trying to understand their rationality, their, the entry points of their system is also something very uh, important. And one remark uh, uh, is that uh, currently in the literature there is uh, not only you know uh, lack of sex disaggregated data. I think there is a lot of literature of uh, researchers working on tackling that. But to, to integrate gender into uh, farm modeling uh, uh, through different uh, uh, you know uh, uh, um, methods and patterns and with different theoretical even theoretical backgrounds to do that to do modeling to or to generate uh, uh, frameworks for model for for models which are gender inclusive. Are still lacking in the literature, and I see. I think uh, there will be a need for uh, to develop that in the next uh, few years. So that was all from my from my side. Thank you, and over to you, Samir. Thank you very much, Ayman. So we have now five minutes or so in case anybody wants to ask any questions. So if you have a question for for Ayman, which I think could refer to either Ayman's work or maybe also Santiago's work, which was presented. Please put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Uh, I see Barbara, you can go ahead and ask your question. Yes, I have a question to Eamon. Uh, you showed the social network analysis, and I think it was all by farms, but later you mentioned that there's a lack uh, of sex uh, disaggregated data. I was interested if a social network analysis has been actually done with you know, uh, different actors, women, uh, women and, and, and male um, sort of household members. If if it would look, uh, look different or if it was the same. And I have a question to Santiago because you showed, um, um, I, I was a little late, but you showed us all these interesting results of you know the trade-offs between different parameters. And it looked as if you had actually very, very, very good data for doing all this trade-off analysis. But the question is a little bit, you know, um, in terms of costs, because I mean, that's, the major problem of getting these trade-offs is that we need all the data to do that. And where would you see, I mean, because if you have limited resources to, to get all these indicators, where would you prioritize or what would you prioritize to really get a good idea of, you know, um, trade-offs between natural resource use and, and economics? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I think Santiago is not with us, so maybe I can take his both uh, questions. Uh, uh, take, uh, maybe I can take both questions. Just to say uh, uh, that uh, no, actually, I mean, from the little uh, from the little review or from the little, I mean, from my limited knowledge in the literature, I didn't yet see uh, social network analysis done uh, separately for men and women for the same purpose. Uh, for example, the technology dissemination or um, uh, getting information for technology. What are the social networks for men to get information about the technology and for women to get the information about technology? I didn't read something like that. And I think it's, uh, it's a nice idea to, uh, to explore because it will definitely give different perspectives. And that's a kind of very cheap uh, uh, method. It needs only really very quick uh, uh, turnaround uh, the different uh, 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 actors or stakeholders to involve in your uh, in your uh, in your uh, analysis and then for each actor you just have you know two pages it's a matrix the to feel uh, based on his interaction the level and the frequency and the intensity of his interaction with the other uh, stakeholders and then from there you can just take it from there with some algorithms you can develop those uh, social uh, networks and uh, waves so i think it's a good i didn't see something like that segregating the analysis for men and women, but um, it, it will definitely give uh, different results. And I think uh, that might be a nice option if we want to explore a strategy for scaling innovations through women and or through, uh, through, uh, through men. Uh, really, it's an idea worthy to keep in mind. Uh, for, the, um, for the farm design, uh, still let me go again and check. I think Santiago is not here, but if he is here, he can maybe add on that. I also uh, had the same thought. To be honest with the audience, I mean, when we started to work on the farm design in Tunisia, that was indeed a very costly method. It takes time, it takes... Uh, and you know, this type of farm, farm analysis, we need to do it at the early beginning of the project because based on that, you have to tell me, or we should say to, or should tell to the rest of the team uh, what they should uh, invest in and in which direction, technical direction they need to go. And, uh, and that was not really the case. For our case, for example, in Tunisia, we at only at uh, the end of the second year that we start to get results and definitely the biophysical team, the scaling team, the knowledge management team will not wait for us until providing such results. So for our results were just to confirm what they would, what they, what they already, the direction they already take, took uh, in terms of scaling uh, the CLCA options. And what they did actually was something much more, you know, much simpler. They just go to the communities, they talk with them, they explore with them the entry point for the system transformation, what are the expectations, uh, uh, what are the prior their priorities and how, and based on that, what, the, what is the level of their acceptance for that and that and that technology, and based on that, they start to engage. When we wanted, to, when we thought about it as CLCA team and we wanted to formalize it a little bit better, we thought about what we call narrative way to describe uh, to describe trade-offs and ways to overcome them. I mean, it's just because it was so evident when you talk about the farmers. So we said, okay, let, maybe we can just make one pages for each type of trade-off and say how we explore it with farmers face to face or through focus groups and based on that what are the preferences of the farmers and what what works and why we took the decision to include for example forage mixtures or farm machinery or something to tackle and to lower a little bit the, the impact of that uh, trade-off and to go for a compromise between the two different uh, conflictual objectives so we thought about this narrative way to do it but it was just you know to tackle the late uh, delivery of the of the models which are indeed costly but also uh, not evident that they will generate uh, results very quickly, which is the case, or which is the case where, you know, which is for what we need them, you know. So, yes, you have right. And that's also, uh, that's also something, something we should uh, consider in our mind, especially for similar projects in the future. Thank you for the answer, Ivan. And uh, Rima here is posting the chat, um, a relevant comment to the question about gender disaggregated data. Uh, but WOCAP has a questionnaire to collect this data and she's uh, kindly shared the link with us there. So if that was of interest to you, please check the chat. We have a question here from Murad who, um, who notes that the, the implementation of these modeling approaches in the two uh, regions is very interesting. But have you learned anything from this modeling, from this research, from all the information you have collected about the actual implementation of the CLCA uh, practices? For example, who is implementing 
why are they implementing or what benefits are they seeing from that? And maybe why, what are the factors which are stopping them from being able to implement CLCA approaches? Yes, uh, three or four things we learned from that. The first thing is uh, respect the diversity. I mean, uh, compared to the first phase of CLCA, for example, we wanted to do the same things and promote the same things everywhere and CA, conservation agriculture, three pillars, do it, you know, take it everywhere, take it, you know, here and there and, you know, semi-arid, humid or whatever. Uh, focus on because it's conservation agriculture, it's the three pillars. But then within this, uh, within this phase, uh, for example, we had a more flexible approach. Uh, we uh, we wanted to make uh, to be to make a strong typology analysis and to focus on the diversity of farmers, and we wanted to have a non-linear approach and uh, uh, different uh, uh, CLCA options to promote in different uh, systems. And that's uh, and that's something which really was very I think very successful, and we learned a lot uh, out of it. Uh, it's not new to this uh, project. It's something which was uh, called for from the literature since a long time ago. Option by context, we know that. But here in this case, we practiced that. Uh, we did it in practice, and we that delivered really good uh, uh, result and helped us to reach, uh, you know, uh, high numbers of beneficiaries, if you can say, especially in North uh, Africa. The second thing is uh, the system entry point. Uh, that's also, uh, we wanted to change the system towards more sustainable systems. It's very, very important to make this, uh, this, this to have this better understanding of our system and to understand, uh, to complement the typology analysis with, uh, with the participatory approaches to better understand what are the priorities of the, uh, of, uh, of the system manager or of the farm managers uh, in the different types with whom we are working with. In th some cases is the livestock uh, when we have to fully redesign the farming, the uh, technical CA, technical package we are promoting. And in some other cases, it's the soil fertility, which is uh, and soil erosion, which is a problem. And then we also have to, you know, to adjust ourselves and to provide a different uh, CLCA uh, options. So system uh, uh, and entry point for system uh, system uh, transformation, which is combination uh, adding to the typology, adding participatory methods to understand really this, uh, what what would drive the system transformation is very, very important. And was that was uh, helping us so much to uh, deliver uh, at scale and to have an impact. Uh, and also uh, the uh, the social analysis of so the social dimension. Social dimension is very strong in the uh, rural areas of the developing countries. Uh, I would say not more than the economic rationality of farmers, but that's also something very heavy which we need to consider, especially if we want to scale uh, innovations and uh, mapping this the network or the local and regional and national stakeholders uh, having smart. A way to map them using even advanced quantitative uh, methods uh, would definitely uh, help us prioritizing uh, our partnerships and uh, uh, properly setting uh, the right partnerships with who we are working. And then comes, of course, the impact assessment of the CLCA options we have been promoting. That's something I would say we can do more, uh, especially you know, especially in the last year of the of the project. But I think uh, because also again there is a strong biophysical dimension to that, uh, we need to you know long term data and it's conservation agriculture. You know you cannot assess the impact immediately. But I think uh, if we have to describe the successes in the way we did, we we were dealing with trade offs in a narrative way, there would be plenty of stories uh, to say and to document.